Ragnarok, everybody! Let's rank some bosses. Cataclysmic events in mythology breed battle between legends, something Ragnarok has no shortage of. Boasting double the variety over its predecessor, a Thor thick boss count is merely one part of this masterpiece. The gang's all here. Pitch perfect storytelling driven by character growth, creative direction framing the experience, innovative accessibility options, a cinema quality soundtrack adding emotional weight, best in business voice acting. <laughs> Tanky hack and slash combat full of nuances and depth, greater enemy variety to go with their boss counterparts, expansive exploration through the Nine Realms, compelling collectibles throughout them all offering in-game and lore-based rewards, and delightful banter brimming with humor and insight into the world of Ragnarok. Before we begin, note that this ranking is based on the Give Me Balance difficulty. Normal difficulties are my preference for an initial playthrough, given the most balanced baseline for rankings. I'd also like to draw attention to Ragnarok's accessibility feature creating boss checkpoints. This optionally allows you to chip away at non-story boss encounters over multiple deaths, a feature I personally disabled. There is a developer caveat that this should be only used as a last resort, which is interesting considering story bosses have mandatory checkpoints. I'm all for accessibility. This is an excellent feature as a toggleable choice. It's frustrating that it wasn't for the story. I had to fumble through reloading autosaves to get the full experience in one go. This won't affect any individual rankings, but it's a contradictory design choice worth mentioning. With that warm up into critical crankiness, what a perfect time to get started with Ragnarok's bottom feeders. Number 25, The Raven Keeper. After the lengthy ordeal of slaying Odin's 48 ravens, I expected a comparable reward. Color me ecstatic when I found out it was a boss battle. There I am, face of wonder. Then all 48 ravens took flight and shat all over it. Ragnarok has three types of boss encounters. Mini boss variants of basic enemies with a few spicier attack variations, overworld bosses that while unique are recycled ad nauseum, like this Trekkie. Then there are fully unique encounters. Ravenkeeper is all three. How does that work? It doesn't. Ravenkeeper is a variant of a Revenant, a pesky enemy and lackluster boss from 2018 that reappeared in Ragnarok as a basic enemy exclusively until now. Shoot arrows to stun it and then spam attacks freely. Riveting. Once thoroughly fisted, it dips out and summons more standard enemies. You are a basic enemy, reskinned as a reward for the game's most time-consuming quest, and you leave the fight entirely for an intermission with mobs you've faced dozens of times. <laughs> Riveting. It checks the second box by summoning an overworld boss for your next break. Anything fresh? Of course not. Ravenkeeper pieces out, making this a flashback fight against an ice variant of a boss you've slain three other times. How is any of this unique? Well, this is the only boss gauntlet in the game outside of Moosefulheim's challenges, and it does have its own story, unlike other reskins and overworld bosses. Ravenkeeper is a failed Valkyrie candidate that capitalized on its physical deficiency with powerful magic to steal the souls of children and place them in ethereal ravens around the realm as Odin's spy camps. What? Well, at least we're doing the realms a service. By dipping into elements of every boss design route in the game, it serves as a crap of all trades, master of none, a thorough disappointment on every level. But hey, at least we save the children. <laughs> Number 24, Ormstunga. What do you get when the game's most toxic species snorts a line? This cracked reptilian mole midget delivers an answer nobody was asking for. The early game is plagued with stunted reptiles who love to scatter and spew acid at you. When your only ranged option is axe chucking and fucking a half dozen caustic hobgoblins 15 meters away from their nearest ally, it ruins your ability to combo, you know, the fun part of combat. At least Storm Stunga is solo and more melee oriented, but to say I was soured on their overall design is an understatement. With increased speed, Stungo quickly leaps in and out of range, shooting multiple acid shots at once. That's all he has to offer over the normal model, which is an embarrassment to boss billing. For all my belly aching, I found him in the post game, way after I'm sure it was intended, and curb stomped him. Either find him early as a punctuation mark to early game horrors, or go late and carelessly deliver a beating through gear creep. No matter your route, Ormstunga is lackluster fodder on fast forward. Number 23, Alva. Alphon? You hate Alphon. 
I hate Alphon. We all hate Alphon. The next act following lizard snipers are nimble elves, experts at fluttering in and out of your range. Alva is no exception, mostly dancing at a distance, only closing in for a wombo combo ending in an unblockable shockwave pushing you back out of range. Lovely. Your primary openings are blue circle attacks for shield bashes and spamming wildly like an aggressive fool. In reality, I expected tit for tat combat like most of the game, trade a few blows, you stagger, I stagger, we all stagger. Wrong. This boss hyper armors through hits to fly away, darting out of your line of sight, shooting unblockable cross beams, throwing block breaking slices, all while you stay at the ready to shield bash. While I wouldn't say this is horrible, entertainment value dwindles when you're forced to be so passive. Me likey button go burr. Rather than engage the player, Alva lulls you to sleep for a shield bash tutorial. Number 22, The Huntress. Rip Alva's torso off and shove it steed side. <laughs> Next. Okay, not quite. The Huntress does rely heavily on ranged attacks, but you control the tempo by shattering her horns for a stun. Controlling the pace of your offensive opportunities is appealing. Showering you in basic enemies while peppering you with arrows is not. Her design simply can't stand alone. This became abundantly clear through her many solo reappearances that make pushovers look like a brick wall. Overwhelming you with melee mobs may be necessary for her to function, but this emphasizes the weakness of her design. Providing agency and creating openings through the horns is a saving grace, but not enough to keep a barely non-standard combat encounter unworthy of the name boss out of the basement. Number 21, Ancients. Back at it again with the chest lasers and crab walking hip thrusts. The Ancients make a half dozen appearances with nothing new to offer over 2018. As an enemy, they're adequate. As a boss, it's hard to value the old over the new, especially when their original design was underwhelming in the first place. Number 20, Troll 2. These were great in 2018, but here, I'm afraid Kratos lobotomized their gene pool. Their offensive output is infrequent, slow, and predictable. When you combine that with stagger ability on par with Ragnarok's weakest enemies, you'll shred through them before they can show an ounce of value. Maybe this was intentional to show you've gotten stronger since 2018? It's a mystery what they were going for. What's not is that overusage of the same design, even when good, will outstay its welcome, especially as a shadow of their former self. Elves. Number 19, The Hateful. Ormstunga, Alva, now the Draugr Champion. Add heightened aggression, more attack power, sporadic hyper armor, and unblockable attacks, boom, now you're a boss. The Hateful uses varied combo length to keep you guessing, mixes up standard yellow block break and red unblockable attacks. It even has a well telegraphed fire burst that signals to you to stop hitting it, lest it explode. The metered rhythm is solid, but turns into a chaotic concerto when fought in numbers. You can return overpowered to blow through it all, but that lessens the impact it has all the more. The Hateful would be above average as a commanding basic enemy design. As a boss, it's a fraud brought down by over-reliance on mob support. Number 18, Blayton. On the way to a monumental story boss, I stumbled on this wolf looking at something shiny in the corner. Hello there. You have faced this enemy archetype countless times to this point, nothing pointed to him being a boss, yet name, health bar. Hello there. His pros go about as far as the enemy being well designed in the first place. They have a compelling variety of pounces, bites, and slashes at fluctuating speeds. This is amplified when they enrage at 50% HP, gaining a more destructive move pool. The con for Blayton is there's no difference between him and the hordes of standard werewolves. Maybe he's a bit faster, perhaps there's a special attack I missed. If it was there, it was so innocuous it escaped my notice. Much like Blayton himself. He stumbles by as a forgettable boss based on strong enemy design. Number 17, The Thick Lads. Screw everything thus far, embrace girth, breathing down your throat. With Alva, I bemoan forcing passive play. Specifically, I dislike how often she forces defensive play with no meaningful counters, primarily by spamming distance attacks out of your range. While these wide warriors force defensive play, they correct Alva's mistake with consistent offensive pressure offering counter opportunities. The trio of travelers uses delayed swings demanding dodges or parries, though their long draw opens small attack windows. Then well-timed parries can flip the script entirely and allow aggressive play to throw However, thanks to their steady pressure and heavy armor, mindless mashing is always punished. Aggressive play is allowed, but it has to be calculated precise, it has to be earned. This shines in similar encounters with the Raider Chief enemy class and Einjurhar captains. Olaf Knotsen plays at a similar tempo, relying on heavy attacks leaving lengthy openings. 
Fisk staggers more readily, but is far and away the most potent with fast flurries, weapon shifts altering his moveset, layered bifrost damage, and startling closing speed. There's even an endgame duo variant with Hammer and Spear who have two entirely different movesets, the Hammer being more slow, methodical, using bifrost shockwaves, while the Spear is fast and persistent with explosive bifrost magic. They're well balanced in tag teaming you and your ally, trading turns through teleportation. While the heavyweight class is leagues above anything thus far, they are held back by their mild overuse, lack of narrative relevance, and feeling more like a mini boss than anything as special as what's coming. Number 16 Dova Keen meets Monster Hunter. Vanaheim's creator asks you to exterminate dragons to craft endgame armor. Crimson Dread is good at two things, being a victim of endless runic spam on the ground, and flying away like a coward. To give due credit, there are a few leaps, bites, and fire breath attacks when grounded, but stunlock kinda negates that. When skybound, you're assailed with drive-bys, allowing you to use drop near to make crimson shish kebab. I love the utility of drop near, so letting it shine is a real highlight. Despite the thrill, most of your damage is dealt when grounded, which is a letdown. I thought that was nice, and that was gonna be the end of it. Then we restored water flow to the crater. I never thought we'd bring life back to these parched canyons. Life will return. You've done something good today, Kratos. That means predators too, right? <laughs> I'm in danger! All packs of wildlife. Yeah, I guess we'll need to put that down too. Same fight, except he tries to snack on Kratos. Big mistake. It was at this moment that he knew. Jokes aside, why on earth does missing a parry give you a lengthy opportunity to hack away at the boss for no health penalty? Otherwise, it's mindless ground spam similar to Dread. Now, I do like these bosses okay, but the finale is the worst by a mile. It cowers on a pillar while forcing Draugr on you, doing ranged fire attacks. Once you thin the basic herd, knock it down with a spear, wail on it, cue more basic mob slay. Excusing this big snooze fest, the wyverns offer fun if easy combat when grounded, and each have a unique way of taking flight for better or worse. Number 15, the Drakes. The second of three predators to exterminate, these massive beasts mix ranged and melee styles to commendable effort. From afar, it'll shoot scales, keeping you alert when disengaged. It has red slamming shockwaves, yellow tail spins, and a few bites. Nothing mind blowing, and with a low rate of attack, there's plenty of opportunity to wail on it, especially if you shatter its ankles with drop near explosions to upend it. While simple, the Drake's design is well executed. Even in the end game against hardened players, it's refreshing to experience something new amidst a sea of repeats. Number 14, the Drekkies. King of the rerun, Drekkies appear early in Svartalheim, in side quests, and as the final predators you must exterminate for Vanaheim's safety. Credit to them, despite their excessive appearances, I was always excited to duke it out. Tail swipes with subtle tells, parryable and unblockable bites, ranged poison spit, and electric charge AoEs to push you away when enraged. Appropriately elementary for the early game, later a measure of progress when you destroy them. What elevates the Drekki above their scaly peers is their duo battle. That might seem strange considering how much I've complained about exploiting poor crowd control. More than anything, I just dislike standard enemies you faced a hundred times detracting from bosses, a battle that should feel special. Duo Drekki doubles the trouble, but keeps it boss exclusive. Rather than overwhelm you through numbers, they opt for combo attacks. The majority of the battle, one takes to the water, shooting elemental spit while you engage with the other. To balance this, the melee forward Drekki is less aggressive than usual. It's surprisingly well paced, with careful design making it far more engaging than the solo fight. It's hands down my favorite in my time as Dovahkiin. Number 13, the Berserkers. The Valkyrie equivalent for Ragnarok, these crystal jelly beans failed to reach their standard. That's not to say there isn't plenty to love here. Each battle is brimming with difficulty, pitting you against juggernauts with various weapon styles. Brutish dual fistings, heavier weapons with slow, unrelenting offense, or mages who stack danger at any range. Most fights have at least one exclusive trick up their sleeve like the Valkyries, with this lot being more mixed in execution. Hard refill does a delay jump off screen, then tracking slam. Now where have I seen that before? Hawk Longer charges a massive AoE you need to weapon toss out of. Skill Thendi teleports around and inflicts Bifrost damage. PLT requires a Shield Bash to stun out of a Shockwave. Frackney has a red dash, often used in multiples. Outside of this, it's a lot of overlap. Begarder is the perfect example, being an amalgamation of a handful of other Berserker tools, offering nothing new himself. 
That's where they fall short. After you face a few, you descend into a repetitive loop that I chastise the bottom dwellers for. Like the Valkyries, their difficulty carries them above it fairly well. Unlike them, the Berserkers fall victim to Ragnarok's other, less desirable boss trends. Three of the fights rely on numbers to spice up the existing movesets. No new mechanics, just them, but what if there were two? At least the one actual duo is quite nice, comboing well on par with Double Drecky. One utilizes magic, the other a fisting approach. The pace of their attacks is balanced nicely, never ganging up on you simultaneously. I can't say the same for Ritzker, whose only new wrinkle is necromancy to add basic enemies into the mix while taking magic pot shots from afar. Even he isn't nearly as egregious as Fip Dagger and her hellish hero. A trio battle with a highly aggressive dual axe wielder glued to your face, while a duo of mages tosses fire and ice your way from afar. Interestingly, it seemed the mages were far less aggressive when you didn't take more than a hit or two against Fip Dagger when you earned openings. So you have to play passive against a trio that already requires you to be extremely precise about when to attack, and then when you can finally attack, you can't really attack. Screw that! I came up with a brutal runic cocktail to let me vaporize the twins in an all-or-nothing opener. Putting the mixed individual executions aside, as an entire package, by your third or fourth fight, their novelty wears thin. With half of them having no special mechanic, slaying the final few to reach the king was more chore than thrill. All of this said, they are undeniably some of the best skill checks in the game. Even the less inspired gank battles ask far more from the player than 90% of the boss roster. Coming up with deadly runic combos, testing the limits of my parry talents, challenging my reaction speed, and outputting damage that commands the highest execution is exhilarating. The bosses to come simply offer a fuller package, even if many don't reach their heights of difficulty. Number 12, The Phantoms. As we say goodbye to the underwhelming and overused and hello to the unique, bombastic battles that define Ragnarok's greatest, I want to pay proper tribute to the best of those below. The Phantoms have a wholly unique battle style. With great visual design amidst a runic whirlwind, your task is to evade and assault the core. Mashing is kept in check with a get off me AoE, encouraging you to counter between defensive gambits, or better yet, find brief moments when the Phantom flashes, quickly hitting it for a stagger. Build Building up stun is the key here, as you may have noticed, its health isn't decreasing. Finding the actual obelisks in the environment is your objective once the phantom is fully stunned. Destroying them in these fleeting moments is your only path to victory. I absolutely adored this formula. Simple, but creative, unique, and satisfying to execute. Their innovative streak is further fleshed out with other elements showcasing new moves. You do encounter them quite a few times, but compared to any of our repeat roster, this was by far my favorite. Number 11, Bjorn. The game's introduction pulls no punches. Pitting you against a bear with fatty HP, impressive move pool depth, and hefty damage output makes this an impressive opener. As an endurance battle, the extensive moveset allows an introduction to many integral components of combat. Blocking is emphasized, then dashed by yellow block breaks, which encourages you to parry, only for red unparryable attacks to enter the fold. Labbing all these nuances against a potent threat is captivating, with story beats elevating it even further. Something is clearly going on with Atreus, from the mysterious spell cast on Fenrir, to Anna morphing into a bear capable of challenging Kratos. Bjorn prepares the player for greater challenges to come, while introducing Introducing narrative building blocks. Number 10, Vanadis. I can't get enough of the Valkyries. Blindsiding my face into a doormat made me squeal with embarrassing glee. The pacing into it is pitch perfect. Atreus is in trouble after his solo adventures, Kratos sets his anger aside to help against the hordes, then before you so much as take a breath, it's stomped out by Vanadis. Her moveset is appropriately subdued for the early game. She blends a variety of arrow attacks with melee strikes. The arrows are blockable, while the melee blows are avoidable or can be parried. I made plenty of mistakes as I adjusted to her style, making Valor's introduction much appreciated. Using rage to heal in the second phase, the battle of attrition becomes increasingly rabid until Freya's reveal. It's a brief but immensely enjoyable encounter with high stakes that had me begging for more. Number 9, Neithog. Continuing our skyrocket into greater quality, we flip right into the battle for Freya's freedom. Those stakes do add atmosphere, as if a legend tearing through the realms to face you wasn't exciting enough. The wide array of attacks it has are excellent. Quick swipes, Bifrost blasts, tail slams to shield bash, sucking in rocks for a quick spray, or holding in for an unblockable blast, slapping the ground to push you away, it's a lot to take in. 
Freya tries to help by shouting constant directions at you, but it's not the best way to deliver information in a fight of this speed. A lot of times the fight fails to communicate, and you miss out that it's on rails until Freya does something like shoot a sigil so that you can continue. I don't have a problem with this in theory, but there's no indication you need to wait, so you're sitting there twiddling your thumbs thinking you might be doing something wrong. I also felt the framing of the dragon felt claustrophobic up close. You can't see its whole body, making it harder to read. It's clear at a distance, but you lose offensive potency. In spite of the awkward pacing and direction, I still had a blast. The wide bag of tricks makes the difficulty spike early, then wane as you learn its tells. Yet every time you feel a slight comfort, it introduces something new to spice things up. There's a clever analog here of ripping a dragon from its home in the world tree, your travel hub, to be stuck in Vanaheim as you attempt to free Freya from her bonds to a single realm. Especially when you consider they are both unwilling pawns, with Odin tying Freya's chains to the world tree's roots, forcing Nithog to protect its go-to snack. Even if the mechanics weren't the clearest on a first attempt, the battle has a remarkable flow to it from each beat in hindsight, consistently elevating the tension until the finale. It's one I feel could grow on me in future playthroughs, an admirable trait for longevity. Number 8, Grilla. There's tremendous build-up to this battle. Angra Boda's introduction is fantastic, Ironwood is breathtaking, and the story revelations within it are compelling. But it is long. Each time we approach bittersweet departure, suddenly there's something new behind door number two. At least the final reveal is her oversized granny ready to make Atreus stew. Creeping through her lair builds excellent suspense. It feels like an excerpt out of Grimm's fairy tales. The battle upon being caught is similarly imaginative. Rather than assault the elderly, your goal is to destroy her antiques. Specifically, her psychedelic cauldron she uses to huff the souls of Ironwood's wildlife. Sheesh, and you thought the wyverns were bad. Destroying said artifact is easier said than done. At the start, you can freely hit the weak jewel. Once she's on to you, you have to make use of the environment to distract her for an opening. Meanwhile, she's stomping, tossing toils and troubles, even making entire levels unsafe. Zooming around the arena like Norse Spider-Man is delightful, and the strategic positioning required here is a welcome departure from upfront hack and slashing. It's a zany concept that reminds me most strongly of Banjo-Kazooie, Boss Revival, I'm absolutely here for. Number 7, King Rolf Cracky. You could apply everything I said about Sigrun in 2018, and it'd be an adequate summation of King Rolf. Difficulty is arguably the game's highest thanks to a wealth of HP and tremendous damage output. His move pool is Ragnarok's deepest on the foundation of the nine berserkers lending their collective design. Going a step beyond Sigrun, his melee style has regular divergence through utilization of all the berserkers' arms, never lulling you into a comfortable rhythm. However, his over-reliance on a foundation of berserkers that had significant overlap gives you an edge in experience. I felt abnormally confident for a fight of this magnitude, and it wasn't hot air. My my first attempt made it to half health, dethroning him only four attempts later. Compared to Sigrun absolutely mopping the floor with me in 2018, this was quite a difference. While Sigrun was also bound by the Valkyrie's base, I would argue their special techniques were more threatening. Moreover, Ragnarok increased your offensive potency. High-end perks are more accessible with RPG simplification. The best armor sets are far easier to obtain, lacking Niflheim's grind in 2018. Drop near adds flexibility, but more importantly, two additional runic attacks, your key damage dealers. Spartan Rage has two new additions, Valor Healing, which can be clutch, but the absolute star is Wrath. Entering Rage stuns an enemy briefly, then delivers a powerful blow. While the damage is nice, the real advantage is the get out of jail free card stun you can use to cover poor decision making. Kratos' weapons also build up elemental bursts. These can be activated for a similar stun, followed by considerably raised melee damage for a moment. All of this is to say, Ragnarok's wide combat toolkit provides you a hefty advantage over 2018. What I appreciate about the King's difficulty is he pushes you to make the most of it. His ranged magic, up-close elemental explosions, the spear dash, the air shockwave demanding weapon tosses, the shield bashable shockwave, the flying yellow dash in, the leaping pounce, multiple elemental shields, bifrost attacks, an armory of weapons with differing attack styles, and on and on and on. 
you have to be ready to deal with this deep bag of tricks at a moment's notice and find your own space for consistent offense. The longer he survives, the greater the error margin grows. Striding the line between being swift and calculated makes this battle one of the game's most engaging in pure combat. While his difficulty may not reach Sigrun's legendary status, nor does he have the story significance that elevates many of the bosses to come, hail to the king for a battle well fought. Number 6, Gana. And now we hail to the new Valkyrie Queen for living up to her predecessor's legacy. Gana has three main advantages over the king. Her moveset isn't as predictable without nine fights backing its design. Yes, she does rely on a handful of established Valkyrie moves, but offers plenty we've never seen before. Higher story stakes as the last remnant of Odin's regime, and deep ties to Freya that are important for her to resolve. Most importantly of all, oh! Valkyries are queens! Give me these wing-laden maidens over expired green Kool-Aid any day of the week. Gana has the charisma to match. She swoops in, slowly pacing, anticipating your first move. There's a strong respect for Kratos' reputation, yet a calm confidence she'll overcome it. She was right. What she lacks in the king's defensive girth, she makes up for it with brutal offense and swift counters. Take this boulder attack with a long tail. It sure was hard to evade, absolutely crushing your HP when you failed. I'm happy that when editing this, I realized you could probably break it with a sonic arrow during the long windup. I really could have used that bit of intel. My obliviousness aside, that's far from her only heavy hitter. To be honest, every attack is a heavy hitter. You'll be lucky to afford more than two to three mistakes before crumbling under her heel. These are easy to make thanks to her randomized routes. As an example, take this blockable double wing slash that can then be followed by an unblockable yellow slam or a backstep into an unparryable stab or stop after the first two hits entirely. This is balanced in leaving generous windows at the actual conclusion, but making the proper read to reach it unscathed means playing reactively with extreme patience. This is most evident after something like like the classic leap and stomp. These come in variable numbers, being strung together tightly to the point you can't attack between them. It's worth it to wait though, because she sits for quite a while, but it's easy for your brain to say, I dodged that one, now I attack, right? Not every attack is so simple to follow up on either. Her feather attacks keep you at a distance, requiring blocking or dodging for certain variants with subtle tell differences. There's even a slight variation that flips into a Bifrost Shockwave. Runic attacks are at least as useful as ever, especially in the opener when she backsteps, allowing you to pin her against the wall with the right moves. Time them incorrectly, however, and prepare to eat feathers. She rounds things out with the wing shield and large AoE, both broken by a shield bash, a welcome opening, though their sudden appearance requires you to stay at moderate range, demanding faster reaction to everything else she puts out. While Ragnarok's diverse kit for Kratos applies, her quickness, high damage, and own ferocious move pool earns my nod for the game's hardest boss. As for the best, it's not that she falls short, really, consider Gana 1F. Everything to come truly is that extraordinary. Number 5, Odin. I've seen some call this an underwhelming finale. I wholeheartedly disagree. At the very least, it was satisfying to beat this old man senseless. For Brock, you're goddamn right. To say that's all Odin's fight has to offer is selling it short. Odin is tricksy, relying primarily on ranged magic, mobility, and arena hazards in the first phase. It's a nice warm-up fisting before Freya's overindulgent torture careens us into phase two. Odin mixes a stronger magical cocktail of Bifrost whips, shockwaves, tracking flashbang orbs, flame sprays, elemental shields, upping the ante with new tricks at every turn. Despite the flashy effects, it's well illustrated, giving it an intuitive flow. This is key with consideration to the game's climax. There's so much narrative focus and payoff mid-battle that adding difficulty on par with the previous two entries would have been a mismatch. Not every fight needs that level of difficulty to excel. There's plenty of substance under Odin's style, more than enough to create a tone-setting clash to conclude Ragnarok. Number 4, Garm. As I played through the story, I wondered how they could continue raising this high bar they were setting for bosses. Garm answers this question with a deafening roar. Immediately, I can point to the camera as far superior to Nipog. With it framed at a distance, Garm uses chains to attack into your melee range, then leaps forward to meet you, using its face centered in the screen for chomps instead of claws in the corners with a claustrophobic view. It made reading the oversized beast's tells far more comfortable. 
I also chastise bosses that camp out of your range, which Garm remedies through consistent engaging attacks, having this later in the game where drop near can fill some of that downtime, and frequently moving into melee range. The chains aren't solely to evade either, you can actually parry and freeze them for a huge opening. Good defense against his slobbering jaw provides them equally well. The only strange bit is in the end with ice spikes and leaping slams. The spikes are stupid easy to evade through lateral running, and the leap is always right in front of Garm, not to Kratos' position, making it equally trivial to avoid. While the combat and mechanics are a strength, its titan caliber spectacle heightens it even further. That's on top of continuing into a god of uncharted-esque escape sequence, into a final phase with puzzle precision, using the spear to knock out weak points. The final focal point is the peak of Kratos and Atreus' understanding of one another. Kratos trusting Atreus' judgment in spite of his mistakes, a crucial decision that has significant payoffs in the game's final hour. Of course, the real triumph is victory while sparing the good boy. All the more for allowing us to pet the damn dog. Number 3, Thor. Ragnarok wastes no time playing its biggest card. Not an hour into the game, we're sharing drink with Thor and Odin, only to skyrocket to Thor's Thunderdome within seconds. With years of pressure to nail this fight, they delivered and then some. Thor toys with Kratos, both through dialogue and a passive taunting combat style that still packs a thunderous wallop. Your deeds are set in stone, murdering his sons Magni and Modi, besting the immortal Baldur, even defeating the corrupted Valkyrie Queen. These are all accomplishments that he lists in disbelief. He wants to see the God of War who struck them all down, yet Kratos wanted to avoid this conflict with the Norse gods all along. Thor eliminates that option. Much like 2018's early bout with Baldur, multiple phases are split with cinematics, each upping the ante on the former's moveset. They also take a lot of unreal punishment and shrug it off. It's a good time to mention Thor's appearance. I really don't understand all the belly aching. He's a strong man. He houses food, mead, and represents as guardian indulgence. The idea that he can treat his body like a dumpster and still tower with power is terrifying. Even when you're on the ropes, he isn't done with you, breaking the bounds of the game to shock you back into mortal combat. Most of his attacks are done through hammer swings and tosses, with a good mixture of blockables, parryables, and dodges required. These have tricky delays, though, occurring well after the colored rings appear. As the battle reaches its final act, he brings the thunder, creating environmental AoEs and shockwaves. This is built on further in his endgame appearance, where he still plays a bit passive and taunts, but progressively uses more force. I would argue he doesn't evolve too far beyond the tutorial fight, with most major new attacks like his slamming thunder call leaving him wide open, making it more advantageous than threatening. It's still a solid evolution of the first round's mighty foundation, and serves as a strong end to Thor's arc. Sad that his moment of defiance against Odin is short-lived, fortunately, neither battle is, and they make a collective well worth a top 3 nub. Number 2, Heimdall. Heimdall would probably be offended to be ranked above Odin. Good. This shitbird made my blood boil. There's no better depiction of power through gameplay than Heimdall's predictive reactions. Heimdall habitually embarrasses your offensive gambits, then claps back with force closer to Gana than Odin. Watching him grab that spear and detonating it was absurdly satisfying. His smirk slowly curling to a scowl as the duplication ruined his foresight was quite amusing, especially once his shaking composure opened him to serious blows. The pacing from detonation tactics to dodge encounter is expertly done. The fight relishes every moment, slowly making his attacks more erratic as your ability to respond improves. As the fight drags on, he becomes more and more feral. Attacks track better, become harder to parry, making openings harder to earn. The concept is a perfect crescendo of difficulty and momentum. What elevates Heimdall to something truly special is the implication of the battle. Throughout the rising tension, there's persistent panic in fulfilling the prophecy, one that foretold Kratos' death after slaying Heimdall. I wanted Heimdall to give up, for Kratos to be spared fate's rigid weave, but Heimdall refused. He sprouts an astral limb out of profound denial of his inferiority, spelling a deadly end for both him and Kratos if the prophecy continues its streak of truth. Frankly, I was not ready for Kratos to die. Having the player carry out actions that could be a death sentence for Kratos bore a heavier burden than any boss in Ragnarok. Heimdall is a resounding triumph of creative mechanics, fantastic execution, and deep narrative gravitas. How could this not be number one? Oh, Valkyries are queens! And my choice for the best boss in God of War Ragnarok, Rest and Mist. In a year of thoughtless duo bosses, 
Wrist and Mist are evidence that with proper execution, the formula can ascend beyond single combat. Moments away from birthing Ragnarok, amidst a stunning primordial backdrop, a familiar soundtrack kicks in as two angels descend from the heavens. Atreus bragged on multiple occasions of your triumphs over the Valkyries one-on-one, -on -one. how will you fare against two of them with Odin's support? It's as tough as you'd expect for all the right reasons. Rather than overwhelming the player through numbers, they're designed to fight in harmony, marked foremost by their shared health bar. Most of the time, they tag in and out against you and Atreus. Even though your primary threat is in plain sight, you need to keep careful view of the other for infrequent range strikes. For example, the forefront Valkyrie Beyblades while the other fires a feather barrage. Later, they begin doing combo assaults with quick line dashes, persistent feather rain to pin you down while the other conjures a boulder, or putting together a wicked fast two-part slam that requires perfect evasion. They have a wonderful balance rewarding good punishes and quickly mixing up defensive demand through their expansive moveset. Their difficulty is quite high, but allows room for your short up skills to shine on subsequent attempts. After every death, I'd reload my autosaves for the full glory, each time seeing a measure of progress. As they revealed more of their moveset, I relished every moment of its clean, intuitive design. Like Gana, while they rely on a few Valkyrie staples from 2018, they establish more than enough refreshing identity. Every time I thought I claimed victory, they called upon the Allfather to revitalize their strength, something delivered through more lethal combos and damage. The dread seeing their health bar level up, mixed with blistering excitement, boiled over all the way to a beautiful quick time climax, with Kratos and Atreus triumphantly clipping their wings. Today's lesson? Say it with me. All Valkyries are queens. Evidenced by today's duo topping a list with a heavyweight top end that could go blow for blow with any of gaming's godly boss rosters.